thank you for, for being here and uh, taking the lead on these issues that are so important to us around anti-Asian violence and also around Asian American representation. And of course, this opportunity for two Asian American guys wearing black to get <laughs> together. All right, now I want the audience to know- Three buttons we, off too, you know. You yeah, two buttons off. Uh, I actually, when you came on, you had one only one button and I think I inspired you to show a little more it the, fell off, man. The, it's the heat in the room or in, through the internet, through the, through the pipelines, and it's all happening. Yeah, and I just want the audience to know we did not coordinate this in advance. Everything from our haircuts to our black shirts, we just naturally do these kinds of things. And, you got my uh, text. You got my text. Don't lie. This, this is very cool. Well, you know, we're both Asian guys, uh, but that's like saying we're both beef, okay? Because <laughs> clearly one of us is filet mignon. The other one is hamburger. And I will let the audience guess who's who, but I <laughs> honestly, I'm the hamburger. I, I, I own that, that fact, all right? So Harry, it's great to see you again. We've had a chance to chat before. Uh, and I wanna know, you know, I'm sure the whole audience wants to know, we've all, as a world, been living through this weird pandemic experiment and experience for the last 14 months or so. How has your time during the pandemic been? I have absolutely no memory of it. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know anything about it. I didn't know it happened. Um, no, it's, it was the, you know, I finished right when it was announced, especially in California and the whole lockdown uh, uh, thing. I just finished a movie like within a couple of days. So I just got off it and then thought, Oh, I'm going to get a little bit of rest. And then when that happened, I was like, oh, no, this is craziness, but I don't know what's what's happening. But it seems like I'm going to get to chill for a little bit. And that little bit turned into, you know, whatever, a year. But uh, I just have I just got a, I had a kid, you know, it was one uh, about a little under a year old. And, and uh, so I had to it was a lot of daddy, daughter and um, husband and wife time. So that definitely um was my pandemic uh, uh, a bubble. Yeah, no, I can totally resonate with that because I think my daughter is is about the same age as yours. And so the, the positive side is we, we bonded and and uh, hopefully I'll become a better better father as well. But does that mean that you, you haven't been acting or performing during this entire uh, time during the pandemic? I did. I actually got to uh, go up to Vancouver and shoot a film, uh, a film with Jimmy O. Yang and Nina, uh, Nina Debrev. And that was really fun, but it was, kind of daunting to get on a plane and to say, oh, I'm going to go and do this thing. But uh, I think it proved that uh, when, if there's a will, there's a way. And, and, you know, we had really great producers that just made it as safe as possible. And, and I was like, oh, well, if we can get through this, then I think um, if other productions are able to do that, so we can still um, uh, provide some entertainment for, for people. <laughs> Um, but so I got to do that and I got to do a couple other things. But for the most part, you know, what was really nice is just to be a be a dad and and I one of the things that I've learned and maybe there is something else uh how to analyze another human being without the other human being being weirded out that you're looking at them and watching every move that they make is so fascinating because you're like when am I, am I ever going to get this experience again and 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 it, it was so educational not just uh, uh, for for me, but I think for, for my wife as well as to who we are uh, learning from from our daughter. Yeah, it's, it's a really weird thing being a parent. Like if you're an utterly self-centered person like I am, being a parent sort of made me get out of myself <laughs> and, and actually be a generous human being, which is sometimes challenging for me. Um, so... Uh, what you know, what what else do you do as a performer during a pandemic like this? I, like I don't know what performers do during their their time when they're not actually on screen. I have fantasies, but I imagine like during your you're, you're not acting all the time. So are you are you rehearsing? Are you taking acting classes? Are you working on your French accent so you can perform that kind of a role? Or are, 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 are there things that you do even if you're not actually acting and performing during this pandemic? Um. <laughs> That is a good question. I reanalyze what I just said to see if I can say it better. No, um, no, that's, 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 uh, you know, I think it's, it's always a situation where, you, you know, when you get in a conversation with someone and then you always say, oh, I should have said that, or I should have said this. It's, I think it's very much like a performing and how you're always just trying to, uh, um, um, analyze your own performance. Cause in a weird way that what I've always learned about, about people in general is that they, 
everyone's acting at a, to certain, they're acting with their parents, they're acting with their kid, they're acting with their wives and not to say they're being fake, but they, they are doing it in a way that, you know, at least honors and pleases the, the person in front of them as to make them feel comfortable to a certain degree. And then you are yourselves and you put a lot of yourself into it. So um, to, to me, it's acting and, and being, I don't know, just, just existing. I feel it's not that much different. The other, the other side is just that it's more technical and you have to do it at a certain period of time and you have to nail certain things and say certain lines, but I, I don't feel it's any, any different uh, outside of what you're saying is, you know, getting a French accent or uh, uh, working on that, which does take a certain skill set and, and a lot of practice. Well, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience want to know, you know, how you got started. Um, you know, what, were you like, you know, Clark Kent and you were fired from another planet and you landed on, on, on planet Earth and you, you were already born as an actor? Or was there a different origin story for, for Harry Shum Jr.? Why don't, you why don't you take us through that? Who, what, what happened to, to make you into the performer and the actor that you are? Yeah, I mean, I wish I was uh, launched off into Krypton, but uh, you know that uh, my my parents were weren't performers. Uh, my dad likes to say after he found out that I was I started acting more, he's like, you you know, I, I got a, I had an opportunity to act, and I just I turned it down because it wasn't my thing. I was like, okay, dad, <laughs> thanks. But um, my dad, my mom and dad, they came from they were born in China and uh, they immigrated to. Costa Rica. Uh, I have two older sisters. They were they were born there. I was born there as well. I only lived there for about till I was four or five. So very little uh, um, broken memories. Uh, uh, not broken memories, but uh, fractured memories that I, I kind of remember here and there. And I was very quiet and shy. Uh, I didn't talk much. But that apparently from my family, my mom and dad said I wasn't when I was one through four. But when I moved to America, I I was because. I didn't speak the language and that language was, was really jarring to the point. I remember, um, I think I was in second grade. I didn't, I didn't understand what the teachers were saying. So I didn't do any of my homework. So when I got home, I just didn't know what they were saying. I didn't know that I had to do these things. So I just stuffed the papers in my backpack. And I remember my dad got called to the school and brought me in. I just remember this converse, this, the, the motions that the teachers were making kind of like I was a bad boy <laughs> and my dad like didn't understand what she was saying either. So he was just nodding and then took out all like these papers and then and, and the home, um, these pages. And from then on, I, I school, school and, and I just never connected with school, just the idea of school. So performing was something in junior high that I started to gravitate towards because um I didn't need to, I can express myself in, in more in physical movement as well as, as just opposed to uh, um, uh, utilizing my skill set of, 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 or learning a, a another language and, and perfecting that. And the first performance I did was, uh, it was an improv. Um, it was an improv and I had to, the teacher really liked it. I pl played this cheerleader and I was being just really dumb and, and, and just being very free. It was the first time I got to just be, um, not myself because I'm not a cheerleader, but I got to be free and I got to do whatever was coming out of, uh, out of my mind. And and the teacher loved it. They put me in, in, in to, to do it on a, in an assembly in front of 500 kids and I just love that feeling to, of making people laugh and making people react to, to something that I was doing. And from then on, I just, I knew I wanted to do something in this, but I didn't know that there was, uh, there were opportunities to actually pursue it uh, with uh, a career in mind. And, you know, my parents never uh, thought that that was even possible either. Uh, so that all just rolled into me moving down to LA and um, getting a shot at trying to be a dancer more so than an actor. And then that really expanded my dance career. Okay, so there's so many questions I have from what you just said, but let's start off with one, one question about your, your background. You were talking about being born in Costa Rica, coming to the United States. So your first language, was it, was it Spanish was the first language that you were Yeah, speaking? Spanish, and then my parents spoke Chinese to me, uh, you know, in the household because they wanted to make sure I learned it. But yeah, Spanish was my first language. So your parents must have had also a very interesting experience because they're immigrants from China, so they spoke Chinese. They, why did they choose Costa Rica? Um, my... <laughs> 
not I don't think he chose Costa Rica. My dad apparently his uncle uh, said, "Hey, come to Costa Rica because there was a small Chinese community there, and it was in Puerto Limon on the east side." And they said it's easier to make money here, you know, and the language is a little easier, I guess. And but uh, you'll enjoy the food; you'll like the food here. So he came over, didn't like it, didn't understand, didn't know how to speak Spanish, didn't like the heat, kind of enjoyed the food, and then uh, did figure out over time that there was, uh, you know, he owned a hardware business and uh, still does, and um, and then you know he got married to my mom and uh, and created a community there. And then eventually my mom said to my dad, like, I, I think we need to go to America to at least expand and at least give our, our kids uh, uh, an opportunity to, to, to be in America, uh, to, to learn uh, from what America has to offer uh, beyond Costa Rica. So, you know, you, we, we see these really cute, you know, TikToks or YouTube video nat, kid, uh, videos now of little kids five, six years old, and they're, they're doing these incredible dance moves. Were you like that kind of a kid? Did you already have a natural talent or, or inclination to, to no, dance? No, dance wasn't, dance didn't come, I, I never really fully danced until junior high. Uh, I, I don't think I even goofed around. I did a lot of like fake wrestling and, and you know, I'd watch like Jackie Chan and try to mimic him uh, and roll around the floor, but never really dance. And it was in junior high, we did this really, obscure musical uh and we had to swing dance and uh i i got one of the supporting leads in it and i got to partner and i just i guess i i i caught the bug and i was like oh i guess i'm okay at this and then it wasn't until high school where you know after a while you want to connect with other students and then like there's this dance team that was performing it was all girls and then one guy and one of my buddies was like dude don't you want to be one of those guys in there too? And I was like, yeah, let's audition. So we auditioned for, for the dance team and then we end up getting it. Uh, and then we started learning dance and I, I didn't know any, I didn't know how to count properly. I didn't know how any, any basic moves. And from then on, we just mimic music videos. So the power of music videos back in the days really, uh, which is the TikTok of, of now um, is, is, was really helpful because that's how I really learned uh, and and got to get better at, at dance and was the kind of an entry point. So I, I think it's just never too late. I think I was like 15 or 16 when I started to really, really dance. Well, sometimes it might be too late. I think it's probably too late for me to try to become Harry Shum Jr. personally. Yeah, come on, man, you gotta come over. We'll, we'll, we'll get you some steps. All right, well, I want you to teach my son because my son is seven years old and he's in a dance class right now. He's the only boy in this dance class. We try to put him into a, you know, a, a classical ballerina dance class. He wasn't having it, but then he wanted to be in a hip hop dance class after I showed him videos of, uh, you know, at Jabberwockies. After, when he saw the Jabberwockies, he's like, yes, this is what I want to do. So. You know, hopefully he'll be inspired by you. And then, I, you know, I can try to be the stage dad. But speaking <laughs> of, uh, of students, we have several USC students. Uh, I mean, a lot of USC students who are excited about you being here. But we have a few students backstage who have questions for you. And I want to introduce the first of them. Helena Santos, who's a first-year student and a biology major, has a question for you. Hi, Harry. If Hi, you... <laughs> If you could give your 18 year old self one piece of advice, what would you tell him? That's a good question. Um, 18 year old self, uh, don't do that. And, uh, <laughs> and um, the serious answer or the, to that question, or I would, what I would tell my 18 year old self is it's okay to be in pain. It's okay to hurt. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be confused. And uh, it's okay uh, to not fully understand everything uh, when everyone is telling you to try and understand everything when you're, when you hit 18. Um, I think that the pressure of, of trying to do so much at that age, um, I think does a disservice to what's to come because you're not, uh, opening yourself to knowing that you don't know everything and that you are uh, willing to learn. So I think when I was 18, um, I, didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, 
front it like I did. And, and I think that didn't really help um, my choices and slowed things down as far as what I wanted to, to do in life. But at the same time, I wouldn't want to say too much to the 18 year old other than, you know, it's okay to go through all those emotions and, 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 and all those things that, that you're going through right now or that you will go through because sometimes I couldn't have predicted what happened a year later or the year after that. And that journey uh, was, I, I, I look back and is so special. And I don't think I would be here if, uh, if, if I didn't have that also mentality of like, I don't know what I want to do yet. And I think there is something beautiful in that as well. All right, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Um, well, speaking of, of this 18 year old self, was that how old you were when you decided to move south to, to, uh, to Los Angeles to start your career? Yeah, I mean, I pivoted. I, I tried to. I tried to go to college. I went to. You know, I tried to go to San Francisco um, State, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I honestly, I looked. I was gonna. My, my, my dad was in business, so I was like, well, international business is that good? And I, I, I went up there, tried major in that, and I, I, I just could not. I, I didn't. That didn't feel right. Um, and also, it just looked like. So so many cross diagrams of, of the things that you needed to, to take. And I, I was just, and so performance, I was still dancing during that time. And I, I met during dance class, I met this choreographer. He had a resume of all his dance jobs. And I was like, Oh, this is interesting. <laughs> My first question was like, so you dance for all these artists. So like, wh how do you make money? <laughs> and he's like, Oh, this is how I make money. I was like, Oh, they pay you to do this. I was really, cause to me, it's either you're, I feel like you're doing it for fun and, 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 you know, acting was a, a, a different level of, of performing for me, but I just never thought that you can make a somewhat of a career in dancing. So, you know, I packed up my bags and, 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 and stopped going. Uh, and then went down to LA to give it a try. And then at that point, luckily I had a good group of friends that from high school that moved down with me. And um, so we had each other, but I had to fib a little, tell, tell a little lie to my parents say, I was gonna try and go to school in LA because San Francisco wasn't working. Um, but that wasn't the truth. Uh, I was really just going to auditions and, and I, I had to hold that lie for about a year to try and prove that I could make it and then devise a business plan. And, and explain that, you know, if I get do this and this and this, I will get to here and I'll be able to pay rent. I'll be able to do this and I won't need your help. Uh, so um, that was my, I guess, international business. <laughs> you know, I have to say that lying to the parents is occasionally okay. You know, <laughs> protect them from worrying too much. I lied to my parents too. Like, you know, I wasn't going to tell them, hey, I want to be a writer. That was like way beyond their level of, of understanding of what I was doing. So at, but at what point though, then did you actually tell your parents, this is what I'm doing. I want to be a dancer or an actor. And, and what did they say? Okay. <laughs> I think that's what they said. Okay. Um, not the okay of like, okay, yes, you should do that. They're like, okay, well, you know, there's a lot of drugs <laughs> in, in, in Hollywood. I was like, yes, I do understand that. Well, you know, you know, and another thing, the reason why we're here too to talk about it, it's like well maybe you should go to china and hong kong to, to you could probably make it there but if you try it here you're not going to get so many chances mm. and you know there's some truth behind it and I, I i got to that was challenged with that you know daily um but i will say that i'm a uh, dance was something that they didn't quite understand they're like okay well you can only dance for so long if in their eyes they're like okay, then do this and maybe go back to school after that. So I was like, okay, let's give this a try. In my mind, I said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try and penetrate every single, like going on tour, going, doing commercials. And then when I started telling them about commercials, when I started getting on iPod commercials, uh, and then I, ha you know, it's funny because, you know, you're very, with Asian parents, you're kind of, they want to know like, well, how much did you make? It's always, a, it's always a question. And then you either have to, put it a little higher, like round up a little bit. Uh, or or you, if you don't, then, you know, that means you're doing well. So I think when they started seeing that and then how I was processing it all, they they were keen to that. But the, the quick funny story is the moment, this was beyond uh, a little bit after I start, uh, started acting, 
I was on a movie with Michelle Yeoh and Donnie Yen, and you know my parents are big fans of theirs. So any every project I was doing, even Glee before, they're like, "Oh, okay, good, good. You you know you're you're getting some jobs, and people are starting to know you. That's that's nice." But when I got on this job with Michelle Yeoh and Donnie Yen, uh, and they heard that, and then my name made it into the Chinese newspaper, that is the moment when they said, "Okay, you should be an actor." <laughs> Because they, there was something that they understood. They like literally called their friends. They called their all my family and celebrated. I'm like, it's this like local Chinese newspaper. I was on, I was on LA Times, New York Times, bef- like before, and 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 this is what they get excited about. So um, I, I, I that that was the moment. That was like further further down the road when they actually fully fully embraced the idea of me being a performer. I hear that story so often from those of us who have immigrant or refugee parents who have who speak other languages, you know, it's when you when you're in the so called ethnic press in the language that they can read and that their friends are reading these same newspapers or watching these same TV shows in this other language. That's when they get really excited because they can buy copies of the newspaper and give it to all their friends. And yeah. that's, their, that's their announcement that they're proud of you, because I don't think they even really fully know what we do. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, because it is a hard because I I can't even explain it in 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 their language. You know, in our in in, in Chinese, sometimes I struggle with even saying like a script. I, I kind of I'm like, well, how do you I forgot how do you say that? Like, a, a, like talk about a character, talk about rehearsals, talk about auditions. Like those aren't words I ever learn mm-hmm. in, in the vocabulary in in in, in Cantonese. And um, so yes, like that I think is a huge thing for for immigrant parents. Right. So Glee was obviously uh, your big breakout role, at least for for the for audiences, I think. Um, so how did you land that role? Um, I so my wife uh, is my girlfriend at the time. She did the pilot, and the pilot was shot months, 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 almost a year before, actually a month, a year before the actual show came out. So she came back home and she was just, just speaking really highly of like the fact that, you know, especially when dancers, when dancers are actually have, there's a show where it would hire a lot of dancers over time. It's a big, like, Oh man, that's, that's nice. And you know, you get, you you get a lot of work out of it. So she was just telling me like, Hey, the show I just did is really funny. It's going to be musical. I think it's going to be big. And I'm like, okay, uh, so the, the choreographer, Zach Woodley, was looking for an actor or dancer that can kind of act. I would say kind of act because all they needed to do was just be there and dance so that the actors would almost feel a little more comfortable during the dance numbers. And um, so I auditioned on a Sunday. These, the lines were for Finn, the main character. There was no name. He was just like, just for, just to be in the Glee Club. And you do these sides and you have to sing. And obviously they knew that I could dance for my previous stuff. And uh, after that Sunday, uh, I didn't hear from them. And a, a week later, I got a call and said, like, we want to book you on, on, on one episode. One episode. So I said, okay, that's awesome. I, I, I'm on a show for one episode. And then it, after a uh, one episode, they're like, okay, we want to have you back for the second one. I was like, okay, I don't know. I, this, my character kind of has a name now, but I haven't <laughs> spoken. So I, I'm happy to be here along for the ride. And then third comes to the fourth. They're like, okay, we want to book you for a week. And then it, it became this thing where like, well, you, you got to tell me if you really, really want me. Cause like, I, I don't know how long I'm going to be here, but at the same time, the show became bigger and bigger. Uh, so, and I started to, um, it was this train that kept moving that either you, you stayed on or, or you got off and you watched it go. Um, and, you know, to, to be part of that show was just, um, it was interesting because it was, it was a show that was so big worldwide, affected so many people. And um, the first time a show has ever really gained success from a musical uh, and and for me to be part of that was was special. Yeah, no, I remember your appearance on Glee. You very very vividly, you know. And then we were my wife and I. We were watching the 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 series uh, religiously, and of course it was like, oh my god, there's an Asian American guy on TV, and not just that, he's a good looking Asian American guy. Not only that, he's got abs. 
and he can dance. You know, now we just need him to speak some lines. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we were big fans of, of you at that time. And our next question, also from a, uh, a USC student, is about this role that you had on Glee. And unfortunately, um, Jose Mendoza Reeves could not be with us today. He had, he had uh, circumstances take him away, but he's a first year communications major here at USC. And this is his question for, for Harry. In one of my classes, we discussed the perpetuation of racial stereotypes. And on Glee, I recall your character being referred to as other Asian and lacking depth compared to other characters. What are your thoughts on the portrayal of Mike? And do you think despite the stereotypes, it was a step forward for having more Asian representation on television? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I know a lot of uh, classes have been analyzing, you know, when you're kind of the stereotypes and uh, throughout Hollywood, uh, you know, going back to even Yellowface to, to uh, um, you know, uh, Long Duck Dong and to, you know, to, I mean, if you fast forward to, to even now and looking at Mike Chang and uh, it is, it is one of those things that a, an Asian, and I'm talking about specifically an Asian American actor has to deal with in Hollywood that is, that a lot of actors don't have to deal with. And I think it's when you're faced with taking on a role, this one was a little more unique because I didn't expect all that. You know, I didn't, I, I, I came to set thinking I'm here for a dancer and, you know, to be a dancer and to perform. And then you start to see this group feeling of, of, okay, we're a bunch of misfits and, you know, they're getting hit with these jokes. They're getting hit with these jokes. But I always think, or my belief is when you're telling jokes, there's also where, what, in what room are you telling those jokes in? And also, are you punching forward? Or are you punching up? Or are you punching down? And when you're punching down for a certain group of people, all those jokes, when you're saying you're hitting everyone equally because no one's safe, but also those, those jokes are doing more damage to a certain group of people. And I had to, I had a difficult position every single time I opened up a script and I had to deal with uh, these jokes because the argument before was always, well, we're, we're hitting everyone equally. So take it or leave it. And it wasn't a conversation. Um, so I, in turn, had to find and devise certain ways to, to uh, I wouldn't say overcompensate, but I had to find ways, whether it be through my physicality, through dance, through, <laughs> uh, um, through, through being, kind of the hero in my little moment that I had to play against these things that I had really no control over during that time when you're talking about 10 years from now as opposed to here from now. And I had to also look a step forward of like, well, if I stayed on the show, if I, you know, which I did, and try and combat that in my own ways, hopefully a generation, which is a even, even or 10 years from now, other people have an easier time to actually have conversations within it, with, within um, the environment, within on set. And also maybe even just not have to deal with these jokes being said because that's been done before and we can learn to not do that again. Um, so that was always my, my, my thought process in, in, in taking that on. And a lot of it was really uncomfortable to have to try and go through. But um, I think the power that your actor, uh, an actor has is the way you say it and the way you react to it. And hopefully um, you can do less damage in ways to show that you can be a whole human being eventually on, on a show that um, at least did allow that to happen as well. You know, it's sort of depressing to hear, you know, some things are saying because the history of representation of Asian Americans and Asians in a particular way in Hollywood has been going on for very, very, long time for decades and decades and decades. And there's so many stories that Asian American actors and performers have, like what you're talking about, that go back in time. And we might think, well, this is the way it was in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, but you're saying this is the way it was in the 2000s still. 
you know. Um, but this was this was this also partly on Glee that you're talking about the sort of negotiation that you had to do to to try to push May, mainly uh, just people. mainly on that. That was the only show I really had to do. That. Other other places I, I was able to have conversations and sometimes even completely take it out. I just also I was you know when you're on when you're when it's your first show and you're that young you you don't know how to have those conversations you don't know and you you know you could put your foot down and say no and then it'd be like okay we'll we'll get another person you know and it's a, and then you in your mind you're like well okay i could i could find ways to to combat that knowing that you don't you you know the power that you have now that we have now is is a, very different than w- what was had in 2010 and and you know even that's why it's so important to have the writers room to to reflect the, how proud they are to have a diverse cast. They should be proud to have a diverse writer's room and a, a diverse crew. That's the importance of that because you feel very alone when you aren't able to, um, when you aren't able to have these conversations, when you look over your shoulder and no one quite understands or they're like, oh, okay, well, you're on your own there. You know, so now to have that a little more, at least to have that conversation is, is crucial, I think, in moving forward. And, and I've been very fortunate to have those in, in projects after that. Let me just point out that Harry Shum Jr. just said, writers are important. Okay, <laughs> it's not just the good looking people on the screen that you're paying money for, but the good looking people wouldn't have anything to say if it weren't for the writers. Yeah, okay? this is the reason I came here, baby. This is the reason I came here. I, I'm ready to steal some books back there of, of yours, especially the yellow ones. The yeah, next time we meet in person, <laughs> I'll give you a copy. Um, but okay, just to make everybody feel bad, how young were you when you got that role on Glee? <laughs> um, I was young in mine, but I was, I think, 24, 20, 24. That's pretty young. Yeah. Right. So well, now you made everybody feel bad, you know. And playing, playing a fifteen-year-old. Playing a fifteen-year-old. That, that, that's, <laughs> that's a nice thing about being an Asian. Being Asian. All know. right. So let's let's turn to another young person here, um, and it's related to what we've just been talking about. This is Alana Aquino. She's a junior, and a music industry major. Hi, Harry. Thanks Hi, so Alana. much for such a great session so far. Um, my question is, the lack of AAPI representation in the entertainment industry is slowly starting to mend. So what do you think should be done to ensure that future AAPI entering the industry are not faced with the monolith misconception that all Asians have the same culture or language or background, stories even? Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a, another good question, Alana. You know, I, first of all, I am the questions being asked, I think, reflect kind of the state that we're in, that people are actually looking deeper and further uh, and asking questions as opposed to the questions I was asked five years ago, um, you know, when, when, when I was on a panel or many panels. And now I think we're looking deeper in what it is, what it means to be Asian. You know, there's this whole idea of group identity and individual identity and the groups you fit into so many groups, like you're a musician. And are you, um, are you Filipino? Filipino? I am. <laughs> Filipino, Aquino, yeah. Uh, um, F- Filipino, but you identify with Asian American or API. And then you have these groups, you're like, well, how much do I fit in into, into this group? And I think at the end of the day, regardless of what that is, I feel that what's most important is, are you gonna tell those, are you gonna tell that story? Are you going to set yourself up to be able to tell those stories in whatever capacity, whether it's through your music, whether it's through acting, whether it's through writing, whether it's through directing and, and really honing on those skills to be able to tell that? Because I think what has been sorely lacking and not to say that it is tr- only our, our, our faults, but because, you know, there's traditional in a traditional sense of, of our, our parents might not what we talk about a lot might not want us to go into into this profession and, and to, to be storytellers or to, to, to be in the arts. But I think beyond that of also having this obstacle of the system not allowing us to even do that and having a harder time to, to, to be that because we aren't taken seriously. What I always thought, what I always um, believe is that, you know, how can we, um, when people say, don't take yourselves too seriously, take a joke, you know, when it comes to I guess even Asian jokes, it's like, well, it's hard 
for us to not take ourselves seriously if society at, at one and never in one point really actually even taken us seriously. So I think what we can do for the next generation is have more of these conversations and, and also look at ourselves and what we can do to fully contribute instead of waiting for that opportunity. How can we create our own opportunities? Um, and, 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 and the more we have these conversations, the more inspired we get. I'm constantly inspired by, you know, Asian American kids just doing incredible things on even on TikTok. I think that, you know, I think those are just, we, we think TikTok is its own thing, but I think that is actually uh, get a lot of uh, kids are getting reps. They're learning how to edit. They're learning how to direct. They're learning how to shoot stuff. They're learning how to act and they're recreating stuff. Very similar to when I was recreating music videos. And, you know, in a lot of ways, that's very small scale stuff. That's like <laughs> compared to what, what kids are doing now. And that is really setting themselves up to when, when they do are, are ready to go into whether they want to go in Hollywood and, 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 and do movies that, that want to tell their story. They've gotten so many reps doing it a certain way that now they just got to switch it up and, and learn this kind of uh, uh, the, the, the technical uh, parts and, 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 and learn to adapt. Um, so I, I think we're in a really good path. Um, for the next generation and and for us to to see so many to see someone like Steven Yuen to you know to to be on uh, nominated for Academy Award it, it's it's really inspiring and, and I think the more we can do that um, what I mean by do is 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 look at ourselves and say okay well they're Asian but I'm a different type of Asian and now I want to tell my own story because they, they, they were able to. So we, we, have, we have these stepping stones that I, I think are really leading us to a, a good place if we keep it up. Reminds me of how when I was growing up when we wanted to make movies, we had a VCR and we had to hook up another VCR and then we just had to edit from one VCR tape to another VCR tape. So I just feel, yeah. I feel like a dinosaur, you know, you Dr. Singh, you know, the, the people today have iPhones and they can shoot movies and everything. Oh, they can do it so fast, baby. They can do it so fast. I, I, I did that, you know, I did that with Pulp Fiction. I, I put it in order. And you're like, well, the artist did that for a reason to not put it in order. So like, I, I, I but I, I know the feeling um, of connecting all those. I, I'm pretty sure you don't know the feeling, but thank you for reassuring me. Uh, okay, we have another question from another USC student, Allison Yi. She's a sophomore, um, I believe theater and acting major, or is that right? Or did you change? Yeah, you're yeah. right. <laughs> Allison, you got the glowing room. I really like it. It's really oh, nice and glowy. So Thank you. Oh my gosh, I'm so nervous right now. But um, okay. Don't, don't 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 worry. I'm 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 a normal human being. i you know, don't don't be don't be intimidated. Right. Go ahead, ask your question. Right. Um, okay. As an Asian American actor on Glee, were there ever times where you wanted to quit the show due to racism or lack of speaking opportunities, like we talked about before, for both not only you but and Jen as well, who is another Asian American actor on the show. And um, what made you keep going other than, of course, having and keeping a job? Because, of course, as actors, once you get a job, it's like you try your best to hold on to it. So I guess what motivated you to stay? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Uh, my dad, okay, so my dad came into this country, or my mom, well, we all did, but my dad came in this country when he was in Costa Rica. He had a lot of friends. He was able to speak the language pretty well. Um, he was able to do business, negotiate, and, and, and do all that. But when he came in, and, and everyone knew who he was and respected him. When he came into America, he didn't feel like he was anybody. You know, he didn't. Feel, he had to go from the bottom and try and make his way uh, up, and it was a struggle for him. But one thing that he always taught me was uh, things take time and learn to adapt as much as possible. And if you're going to sacrifice and you're going to figure out what you need, to, if something that you feel like you're going to need to sacrifice, know what the reason is. Try and find what the reason is. Because if you look at the long game, it'll come back uh, full circle. Um, and then I started to look at all those other previous actors that, you know, 
didn't have the opportunities. You know, even actors in the in the eighties, like uh, Jonathan Kwan, who played Short Round, um, and, and and even going back further, if no, no one knows about it, Sesue Hayakawa. He was a silent film actor. If you don't know who he is, look him up, and you'll be blown away by this man, this Japanese uh, um, uh, Japanese actor that was one of the biggest stars at that time and was just as popular as Charlie Chaplin and, and Douglas Fairbanks, and, and we don't know anything about him. Uh, the sacrifice that they made during that time is, is to say, like, we need to either do something about this or, or be smart about our position that we're at and figure out how is this going to benefit long term if we do it a certain way. And not, not to say that everything I did was correct. Um, and there's certain moments that I could have spoken, spoken up, but at, at a time when things are moving so fast and it's such a huge, huge ensemble cast, you know, it'd be different if it was, uh, you know, it was two leads and then you can talk about those things. Um, so you're just fighting for just to stay on screen. Um, and I don't think it was ever a thought of, of, I just need a job because, you know, I was very fortunate that I had a really successful dance career. And then, you know, some people may say that that's taken a step back, but then they, I could have made money through that way. To me, I started to look at like, I'm, I never set out to represent Asian Americans and, and even projects that I do now, I'm not representing Asian Americans. Like uh, Alana had that question because we are also different and diverse and vast that it's impossible to do that. Now, I feel at that moment, I was representing a certain portion of Asian Americans that um, still live with these stereotypes and figure out how can I flip these stereotypes. And in a lot of ways, I always look at how to create more to the point when they stereotypes don't even become stereotypes anymore. Um, because we have to understand humans, there's a stereotypes for a reason because there's so much that's happening with our lives. Look, I, I may be, uh, I'm, I'm looking in very basic terms that, you know, you could say we can stop these stereotypes, but you can say, well, let me just add like five and tw five and 10 of stereotypes on top of it. And then do they become stereotypes still? Because now I'm a full whole human being, but I just gamed you on thinking that that was a stereotype. And so that's what I tried to do on top of that. There are all the negative uh, stuff that, you know, I think we should critique and we should look back and say, let's not do that anymore, or at least be a little more creative with it if you're going to do that. But on top of that, you know, you got to show that, you know, you got to do, you got to be an artist, you got to dance, you got to sing, you got to, you know, show that Asian males are desirable. You got to, you know, you got to show that, um, that you're more, there's more dimensions than just being Asian. Unfortunately, a lot of times during that, that's why it's important that, that people who are writing stuff about other ethnicities or other race, that they have a good knowledge that they're knowledgeable about that. If not, then bring some people in because you're going to mess it up. Like if you ask, you know, even me to, to write anything about uh, Muslim, you know, Muslims and Muslim Americans, like I'm, I'm going to get it all wrong because I don't have that. And, and you say, you're going to write jokes about that and that's going to be okay. So I think we, we have to take a look at, at, at that time, what it was and analyze it. And hopefully it was there now for us to benefit, to not do that again and to not go down that path. So um, I don't look at that and, and regret it. I don't uh, look at that and say, I, I wish I wanted to done that because I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity, but I know that we can do better and we must do better. And I think we're in a place to be able to do better. Do you think that um, Hollywood thinks, the people in Hollywood, do they think there's any connection between the history of how Hollywood has treated Asians and Asian Americans as performers, as, as workers in Hollywood, and the way that Hollywood has represented and misrepresented Asians and Asian Americans for decades and decades on screen? Is there, do, do, do people in Hollywood see any connection between that and the current climate of anti-Asian hate, or do they separate it completely in their minds that they bear no responsibility? For what's happening today, I honestly think there's a couple. There's, I think there's three groups of people, right? And I, and I think obviously it's more detailed than that, but um, I think there's a group of people who 
really don't mean to do harm and are, are, are writing because what the system has allowed them to write that allows them to make money and, and think that there's an audience out there and no one has, has held them accountable, right? You have that and then they keep doing it because they really truly don't know the full history behind the damage, uh, how much damage they can cause by, by doing this. And, you know, and I think there's probably a group of people who know what they're doing and, and, and might, we might never know who it is. And then I honestly think there's a group of people who are just completely ignorant to what is happening because they have so much on their own plate that they cannot process taking anything else on that's not about themselves. Um, and I, I don't, and I think that's why these continued conversations when we ask questions as opposed to like, when, when you at, we have these talks about with Asian Americans and like about racism, I'm like, I, I don't, why are you asking me? Like, I didn't, I didn't do this. I didn't put this on. I'm just telling you my experiences and what I felt that that wasn't right. Right. And then shouldn't we interview and talk to creators, producers, writers that did these projects and, and, and have, um, uh, put us in a position where we have to have these conversations constantly and trying to figure out, undo the, the damage that's been done. Like, I think that's where the focus actually needs to be on because I can't answer that, uh, full, you know, fully outside of what I've experienced and what I see and, and, and the conversations I've had. Yeah. Well, maybe we're making some, some, some progress in making Hollywood people feel guilty. You know, we're, we're seeing apologies now from people like, you know, Jay Leno and, and Hank Azaria for things that they've said and done. You know, you were referring to jokes, you know, jokes that punch down, jokes that make fun. Those are not good jokes. You know, it's not as, it's not as if we Asian Americans can't take a joke and we can't tell jokes. I mean, I love a good Asian joke when it's good, man. When it's good. good. I mean, like Margaret Cho, Margaret Cho and Russell Peters, they make a lot of Asian jokes about our accents and everything like that. That's funny. Well, spot because, on. They're you know, so good because they know it. They know, they know it. it. And they're doing it out of love. They're not, they're not like, they're not like making fun. In that sense. Yeah. Hey, uh, there's a comment from the audience. I just wanted to share it with everybody. Uh, an anonymous attendee says, I've been waiting for this Asian centered glee conversation for years now. And so, you know, we at the University of Southern California Visions and Voices program are happy to give it to you. Um, and we've been talking about the role of Asian Americans as artists and as storytellers and as performers. And Charles Liu from the audience has this question. With the proliferation of Asian stories in this decade, do you, Harry, have any tips on how Asian performers and creators should be collaborating to produce more ethical content? Yeah, I look, I when I was going back to like even when I was when I was on Glee and I didn't have very many lines, uh, you know, and I was just I, I, I was still working my ass off, right? I, you know, background work is a lot of work in the sense of I was still trying to create a character that wasn't written on the page. And, and, and I, 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 I am proud of the fact that people recognize that to the point like, what's that guy doing back there? <laughs> you know, what's his story? And, but the reason I say this is I had to jump out and be like, okay, well, I want to create content with other people. Um, people that maybe, that I don't have to try so hard to explain everything constantly. So I went out and, and, and I remember the Wong Fu, uh, Wong Fu Productions, uh, you know, Will, uh, Will, uh, Phil and Wesley, um, I saw one of their skits, I reached out, that's the power of the internet, and they reached back out and they said, let's make some skits. And we, we produce, I mean, we, uh, we created this really, f these fun skits that were just fun and, 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 and they gained in popularity. And then from then on, we, we got to do a series together and now Phil's writing a couple of films and, and, you know, who knows where that collaboration will go. But I also just say like, I think that's, that's the beauty that we, uh, that at this moment in time is I think more people are actually really open to collaboration. And if you don't do that, if you don't reach out, and if you don't um, put yourself out there to possibly have a couple of no's to hopefully get you know, some yeses or that one yes that will turn into something beautiful. 
And I think the power of collaboration, of uh, not just sticking within your, the East Asian crowd, you know, and I think opening up to Filipinos and then learning about Thai culture, learning about Vietnamese culture, Cambodian culture. And, 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 and I think that is what's going to cause this beautiful, um, content i hate to use the word content but beautiful stories that you can achieve because whether you're telling a cambodian story right to have uh, uh asians from different backgrounds to be able to see it in different lenses to be able to kind of tell you you know how it's perceived and 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 to get that insight i think it's just massive uh, and, and I think that's how we'll grow as Asian Americans. So not everything is leaned towards, look, I'm Chinese and I, I, I do understand that, you know, a lot of these stories start leaning towards East Asians and, and, you know, a lot of people feel erased or, or, and, and you, and feel like their stories aren't being told because it's always about the Koreans or Chinese, you know, or, or, or Japanese. And, and I think we have to, we have to do better within our community to open our ears and open our hearts to, to be able to help elevate and, and, and support these stories as well um, because they're, we're part of this community that I think if we don't hold on together, then I, I don't think we'll, we'll ever really be heard in, in whether it be in Hollywood or in society. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you said, it's a really diverse community, really huge community as well. And it's obviously awesome that now everybody wants the next Korean story or the next crazy rich Asian story. And yet there's so many stories that are still not being told from so many diverse communities within the Asian American Pacific Islander umbrella. So Juliet from the audience has a question that's uh, near and dear to my heart. It's a question about failure, um, because I think failure really reveals a lot about people and how they how they cope with it. So. Julia asks, what is your biggest audition or acting failure and how did you grow from it? And if you, if you, if you haven't had a failure, just make one up. Okay. <laughs> no one wants to, to know that Harry, Harry has never had a failure in his life. So go ahead. Um, I, I look, I, I will say just, just, an, just an actor being an actor. If, if you, I, I think I've gone on at least, at least six, 700 auditions. I don't know. My manager's on this, so she might be able to cor uh, correct me. I don't know if she's counting, but I, I, I feels that way. And if you look at my IMDb, I'm sure it's not five. It's clearly not five hundred. And so those failures, you kind of eats you up inside to to know that every time you put yourself out there, you're gonna get a no. But I had one where I think it was for San Andreas for um, uh, I think it was for a rock movie. And, you know, when you're an actor, you kind of psych yourself up. You're like, okay, it's, these lines, I, I got to be like super dramatic. It's, it's like an earthquake movie. <laughs> it's a movie about an earthquake. And I said, I'm going to go in there and I'm just going to, I'm going to do all the physicality. I'm going to just, I'm going to make sure that they feel like there's going to earthquake in there. <laughs> and I'm going to commit. So I went in there and I'm pretending to like do 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 everything that you need to do and 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 uh, to to kind of mimic the the feeling of, of an earthquake. I was ducking through uh, under the desk and um and then just like huffing and puffing and and then after after like three four minutes of doing this, the cast director said, "Okay, you know um we're gonna do that again and just look at the cam, just look at me." and say your lines. And, and, and this was me just thinking like, I, you put yourself out there and you automatically at that point know that this, 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 this job is not yours. And, and those are those failures. And that's a very small failure in, in, in the scheme of like um, auditions to know that, okay, let me readjust. I'm glad that happened because now I know not to go that far. Or maybe at that moment, I'm going to keep going that far on every one of them. And maybe one of them is going to appreciate that and, and, and book me on that, that job. So I think when you talk about failures, um, they all come in different uh, shapes and sizes. Um, I have many failures of things that I, I literally put me on a downward spiral and depression when you don't get a certain job that you worked your butt off and you feel like it was so much yours. 
um, and then you see it happen and then you see the movie come out. But there's, there's a beauty in, in knowing that that is happening for a reason. And that sounds so cliche, but it's, there's a reason why it's so cliche because it's so true. Because if you keep having that mentality of perseverance, I think that is, you have, the, those failures at least are justifying um, the moments in your life and having perseverance with that is is what's going to create success um so i guess that is how i feel about failure well let's not end with failure let's end on a couple of uplifting notes uh, uh from the audience we have a question from uh, let me see uh, isadora rivera what are the standout moments on from your time working on glee ah there's a lot I mean, there's, we got to go on tours and sell them out uh, in all, all over the world. You know, we got to sing and dance every single day, pretty much. Uh, I would say the stand-up moment was probably, I would say the stand-up moment was that, was a moment we did up front. Uh, upfronts for people who don't know is a, is a thing that I don't, I don't even know if they have, it happens anymore. It probably does, but basically where, where networks try and sell their TV shows, uh, to, to advertisers. And we had, and that was very rare to perform and, and us as performers on, on Glee, we performed on there. And it was a moment where no one really knew what was going on. This, this train was taken off, but we did, um, somebody to love. And it felt like we were in the show doing it because it was very dramatic and, and like a choreographer giving us the speech of like, all right, guys, you're going to do this. Um, you're you're, you're, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna kill it because um, you don't get to redo this again <laughs> because you're doing it live. And we got to perform it in front of hundreds, hundreds of people who were truly excited uh, uh, for us to be there. But it was the first time we felt like a group. And I, I think that is what makes me so happy to be part of this industry in, in, in those ways, because the collaboration and the group feeling of doing something and accomplishing it is, is there's no better feeling. And we can, we can talk about funny lines, memorable moments, but to me, that is what this is all about. So the more we can have that, I think you can achieve so many amazing things. And um, that was, that's my favorite moment uh, of Glee. Well, Harry, I just want to thank you for sharing so much of yourself, your time, your insights with, with all of us from the audience. I also want to thank Kalina, uh, Alana, Allison, and Jose, who couldn't be here for their questions. And for all of you in the audience who've been so engaged, I think, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of Harry, have been ever since I saw his abs on Glee and realized I would never have abs like that. And, and that's okay. Uh, but I just want to, I, I never thought, I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would be sharing a screen with Harry Shum mm -hmm. Jr. And I just want to wish you the, the continued success. And, and uh, I know you're not representing all Asian Americans, but nevertheless, when we see you on screen, we're, we're so thrilled. And uh, you know, your success is our success too. And, and hopefully opening more doors for more Asian American performers and actors out there and, and persuading more Asian American parents to believe that their children can grow up to do things like Harry Shum Jr. Hey, Vian, I want to say one last thing too is, you know, it. it it is an honor because I never thought I would talk to a Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, uh, and, 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 and your, your book, I think is, is both, both of them is, is really changing the way that, that people feel and, 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 and think that they can know that now that they can achieve something that, uh, especially when, when you're critiquing, um, the way the world is in such a creative and clever witty way so um I, i'm 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 really it is really an honor and it was really an honor to talk to you before and really an honor to talk to you now so thank you man thanks so much um yeah by the way for asian american parents out there i'm not sure what's more terrifying their ch child coming home and saying i want to be an actor or i want to be a writer <laughs> so, uh, or, or or i want to be a writer and an actor <laughs> oh, yes, a, writer, a writer actor and a dancer a triple threat <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right thanks harry thanks everybody yeah thank you everyone